This program contains dramatic reenactments and material that may be disturbing to some audience members. Viewer discretion is advised. Hey, what's that? When a light aircraft crashes in the African bush, Losing an enjoyable business trip, put your head between your knees now, becomes a journey into As the badly injured become easy prey to deadly predators, two of the survivors trek out into the hostile wilderness to find help. While time is running out for their dying friends, what it takes to survive on I Shouldn't Be Alive. Botswana in Southern Africa, a country dominated by the Kalahari Desert. It's one of the harshest and most remote regions on Earth. It's also home to some of the world's most dangerous predators. Carl de Plessy is executive director of a South African-based courier company. He's setting off on a promotional tour of Botswana. He's hoping to combine business with pleasure and has chartered a private plane for the job. I enjoy flying, so I don't often have an opportunity to just relax and enjoy the journey, so I was really looking forward to it. Carl's close friend and business partner, Ned Graurak, is also coming along. Originally from Serbia, Neb has lived in Botswana for more than eight years. Joining them are their business colleagues, Mike Nikolic and his wife, Lynette. Ah, young lovers. Married for just nine months, Mike is also from Serbia, and Lynette is Botswanan. Today, she's a little nervous. I was just feeling a bit uneasy. I thought to myself, Lynette, if you need to say anything, it should be now, because now your one foot is on the first step. But I couldn't get myself to express my feelings to anybody. It was all internal. This plane trip is going to change the lives of everyone on board. <laughs> They're flying from the capital of Botswana, Gaborone, to the small town of Mound, 600 miles away. It's a two-hour flight which will take them across the vast wilderness of the Kalahari. The desert, whose very name means the Great Thirst. You guys, help yourself to some soft drinks in one of those coolers. And where's the uh, champagne, caviar? We're having fun. I'm sitting next to the pilot and I'm really enjoying the, the flight. And uh, behind me, Ned, Mike, and the Nets just talking. So it was quite a, a jovial atmosphere. An hour into the flight, Lynette still has bad vibes. For some reason, I was becoming claustrophobic. I'm not enjoying my flight. I'm looking out and wondering and looking. Don't worry. You take a big plane back, huh? I had experience flying with the small planes, so nothing really uh, uh, that you could sense or see that are problems. I looked towards one wing, the engine, and I saw a bit of oil coming out of the wing. Yep. Look at that. Costa! What? There's oil coming from the engine. The plane is losing oil from its port engine. First of all, there were drops, and then it becomes a proper brownish line. Pilot Costa Marcandinatas tries to reassure the passengers. Uh, it's nothing serious, just uh, sit back, keep your safety belts on. Without oil, it's only a matter of minutes before the engine will overheat, seize up, 
and even catch fire. Costa has no choice. He must shut down the leaking engine. Hey, watch that! It's just a precaution. I have to shut up the port engine. It should be possible to fly in one engine, but the plane is losing altitude. Cabrera, we need to make a precautionary landing. Costa radios the control tower to get his coordinates so we can find a landing strip nearby. What are they saying? They can't pick us up on the radar. Just, just look for a landing strip. To land safely, this plane needs a landing strip of at least 3,500 feet of clear open ground. There's nothing out here. You've got to keep on flying. Uh, I'm losing altitude. I, I can't. Deveron requesting our position. As the air traffic controllers are trying to find them on the radar, their only lifeline is cut off. Damn! Cross radio contact. There's no potential landing strip in sight. The plane is now so low, Costa knows he's going to have to crash land into the trees. I took Mike's hand, I took Neb's hand, and I said, God, I'm just asking for a safe passage. Well, I know that I have maybe a minute or a minute and a half to live, and I'm just worried about my children. I remember elephants uh, running in a panic because of an aeroplane coming. I just saw the earth coming closer and closer and closer. I know that air crashes, you really don't survive. Put your head between your knees now! crash should have killed them all. I'm still alive. I open my eyes. I see my wife. She's burning. Metal's burning me! Ah. Help me, Mike! When I touch that belt to unbuckle her, I realize it's very hot and I burn myself now. Parts of the plane are on fire. Everyone begins to worry that the whole thing could blow up at any minute. We need to get out of that as quick as possible. Your body is in a kind of state of shock. I'm back. You try to get up and you just fall down. You guys okay? Guys, what is name? We realize, but there is no name. It's in the plane. It's there. It's there. It's still in the plane. Let's get it. We are panicking because we don't know. How fast the aircraft's gonna be. Okay, this is still being I don't know. The plane has crashed in the African bush. Help me, Mike. Miraculously, all five passengers survived the impact, but after dragging themselves from the wreckage, the plane exploded.
Within seconds, they have escaped death twice, but they are shocked and injured. There's lots of blood around. Uh, my nose was broken. Mike, Costa, and Carl's injuries are superficial, but Lynette and Ned's are more serious. The pain was unbearable because, particularly of the ribs. Just breathe, just breathe, just breathe. Just breathe. And uh, I actually couldn't breathe. Lift me up, lift me up. Okay, I'll cut you, I'll cut you, I'll cut you. Let's take him to the tree. Neb is in agony. The only way he can relieve the pain in his chest is to prop himself up. He's broken a rib, and it's punctured his lung. Now air is leaking into his chest cavity, forcing the lung to collapse. Lynette has also been badly injured in the crash. She has burns that are so deep, the nerves beneath her skin have been destroyed. I didn't feel any pain. There was no pain at all. Nobody realizes that her injuries are life-threatening. Don't worry. You're alive. That's all that matters. Out in the bush, without immediate medical attention, her burns will become infected, sending poisons into her bloodstream. She could die within days. We realizing now that it's getting dark, nobody can land. So we're getting used to the idea that we need to spend the night here. Mike, Costa and Carl sift through the wreckage looking for anything that might help them survive a night in the bush. Anyone got matches? One of the first things they need to do is light a fire. It is a sample only. They've got some lighters but they're all empty. And a fire is the only thing that will scare off predators at night. Oh, we've got to get the fire going and keep it going all night. Who knows what's crawling out there? I was very concerned about the uh, area where we crashed. But when I look at those trees, I was thinking this is a perfect area where leopard is leaving. It's, it's, it's a very dangerous animal. Lots of hyenas. Lots of elephants, lions. It's a really wild, wild area. Eventually, Carl manages to start a fire using the last piece of smoldering wreckage. The five survivors prepare themselves for a terrifying night in the bush. They know it's a dangerous time. It's when hungry predators like lion, leopard, and hyena are out hunting. On the lookout for weak, vulnerable, or injured prey. I can hear things move around in the forest, and I'm generally quite uh, fearful. It's a totally alien environment. You can feel the presence. There are they, you know, you don't see them, but you can feel that there is some, something is around you. Surviving the crash was one thing. Keeping alive in the African bush will be an altogether different challenge. It's been 16 hours since a small plane crashed in the African bush. The five survivors have no food or water, and two of them are seriously injured. Hey! Despite the threat of animal attacks, they've made it through the night. Wake up. But the day brings the African bush's biggest killer. 
dehydration. The morning came and thirst. I, um, I wanted water. It was something I needed desperately. I'm so thirsty. <sighs> The thirst is unbearable. Your mouth is so dry that you can even feel the pain in, in, in your mouth, in your tongue. With no water available, they take advantage of a limited source. Dew. You get a little bit here and there, a couple drops, but it's, it's not enough. In no time, the African sun evaporates their only source of water. If rescue doesn't come soon, they could all die. Suddenly, their hopes are raised. Can you play? Carl is hoping that rescuers will track the signal from the electronic location transmitter, or ELT, usually found in the tail of commercial planes. The ELT emits a radio signal that is relayed via satellite to receiving stations on the ground. It can detect the position of a downed aircraft to within 25 miles. Over there. Over here! Oh! To attract attention, they make smoke by burning one of the plane's tires. But it's not a rescue plane. We look up, it's very high and it's clear that it's never going to see us. Carl can't understand why the emergency location transmitter hasn't brought rescue. You check if it's transmitting. ELTs are compulsory equipment in Botswana. You have transponder, right? It's not compulsory. Turns out this plane is registered in South Africa, where they're not. So now no one knows where we are. It'll make any search and rescue mission almost impossible in the expanse of the dense African bush. What goes through my mind is this absolute feeling of being stranded, of being just total desolation. Carl fears that rescue isn't coming. Mike. That's it. He makes a momentous decision. We're gonna walk. Don't be crazy. I make a decision to go and look for, for assistance. I go with you. No. I'm not injured. I'll go. Be safer with the two of us. The decision to walk is not an easy decision to make, but it's a decision that I've made, so Costa and I set off. They leave Mike to cope alone with two injured crash victims, no food and no water. It was very frightening because now I felt this is getting very serious. Carl and Costa think they must be about 150 kilometers, that's 90 miles south of the town of Maun. I think it's quite easy to walk five kilometers an hour. If I walk eight hours a day, I can walk uh, 40 kilometers a day. I can walk to Maun in four days. But it's a long shot. If they get lost in the bush, they could die, and then, so will all the other survivors. As Carl and Costa leave the crash site, the temperature in the bush rises to over 100 degrees. Mike, Lynette, and Neb have had virtually nothing to drink for over 20 hours. 
And to make matters worse, the impact of the crash has damaged Lynette's spine. She can barely move. Her burnt arm is deteriorating rapidly, and she is desperate for water. My throat is burning. I don't have energy. I mean, it's like completely dry in from my throat right into my tummy it's dry and it just needs some sort of moisture water Lynette is dehydrating more quickly than the others because of the third degree burns on her arm and her upper body the outer layers of the skin that protect the body against fluid loss have been burned away and water is evaporating from the exposed tissue her condition is now critical her only chance is that Carl and Costa can get help. But as they continue walking through the bush, it becomes increasingly impenetrable. Walking through the bush is turning out to be extremely difficult. You have thorns sticking into your clothes all the time. They're barely making any progress. Costa, over here, quick. But then they get a break. track they found an elephant path the bush is crisscrossed by hundreds of these paths made by elephants treading down the foliage and knocking away the trees and it could lead them to water you know the elephant walks from water hole to water hole week in week out year in year out decade in decade out so it's a proper path it's easy to walk the elephant path gives Carl and Costa a clear route to follow, but it also increases their chances of meeting up with the animal that kills more people than any other in the African bush. After surviving a plane crash in the African bush, now, no one knows where we are. Carl and Costa have set off to get help. They've been following elephant paths for six hours in a desperate hope to find water. Costa, Costa. Look. At last, they stumble across a watering hole. But the elephants got there first. It smells awful. It tastes awful. It's full of excrement from the elephants, urine from the elephants. It's really foul. The water is a breeding ground for dangerous bacteria. If they don't drink it, they'll die of thirst. But if they do drink it, they could die of dysentery. It's a tough call. Their bodies instinctively try to reject the putrid water. And yet, when you're thirsty, it's drinkable. The survivors back at the crash site are facing a similar dilemma. What came to my mind is to drink urine, so that is the something which will carry us alive. You know, I was worried about kidneys, I was worried about degradating and things like that. There is nothing else we could do. It was the only option. For Mike, Lynette and Neb, drinking their own urine is a short-term solution. As they become more dehydrated, their urine will become increasingly toxic. Stranded beneath the relentless African sun, they're pinning all their hopes of survival on Carl and Costa. But Carl and Costa are exhausted after hours of walking. They collapse, oblivious that elephants in the surrounding bush have sensed their presence. Elephants have poor eyesight, but a keen sense of smell and hearing. They also have unique sensors in their feet which can detect movement from anything that might threaten their young. Elephants kill 10 times more people than lion or hyena.
Costa knows that in this situation, the best thing is to remain still. Don't move. Don't move. It is absolutely petrifying. Costas is telling me not to move, Stop. but I am unable to follow the instruction. Eventually, even Costa can't take it anymore and runs for his life. Luckily, the elephant decides to warn them off instead of trampling them to death. But the African bush has another surprise in store. A freak storm. Rain is a welcome relief, but Mike is struggling to collect it. I put various plastic things around just to try to collect some, some water, because obviously that's what we need. But the rain brings with it a terrible worry. It could put out the fire. Without fire, they're vulnerable to attack by predators. I put something over the fire from aeroplane just to protect direct water coming into the fire. Unfortunately, before any water can be collected, the rain stops. The survivors are left as parched as if the rain had never happened. Being wet and still be very thirsty, it's horrible. As Carl and Costa trek deeper into the bush, Carl begins to have a horrible suspicion. We are walking towards Marne. We should be directly under the flight path. Where's the planes? Costas and I discuss why we haven't seen any planes. We're heading the right way. I just feel that we are, of course because I find it very strange that nobody's looking for us. Carl's suspicions are correct. Their flight veered way off course and crashed in uninhabited bush 140 miles east of Mound. That's why there are no rescuers searching anywhere near the crash site. Carl and Costa are walking north to nowhere and time is running out. Things are getting worse and worse. Lynette is now getting more seriously sick. Sometimes you, she loses herself for 10, 15 minutes, doesn't know what's happening. Neb is panicking, he wants to go now. Mike was trying to advise me not to go. But uh, sometimes you have this fix in your brain, you want to do it. Mike is too exhausted to stop Neb wandering off into the wilderness. Sleep deprivation and chronic dehydration are causing Neb to hallucinate. I wanted to find village with the people who will just pull us and rescue us. You really believe and you really see something what is not there.
Suddenly I hear him shouting, there is a water, come and see. Well, obviously after all stories which we went through and um, uh, I, could, I did not believe him straight away, there is a water. But this time, it really is water. They use their lighters as cups. These few sips will barely see them through the night. Carl and Costa aren't even that lucky. They haven't found any water all day. It's only a matter of time before dehydration kills them all. As Carl and Costa struggle north to a town that isn't there, their friends at the crash site are losing their battle to stay alive in the bush. I woke up in the morning and I was aware that something was irritating my left hand. And I looked and I lifted up a little bit and I saw all these little wiggly things on my hand. When then I realized it was maggots. Flies have laid their eggs in the wound, and now the larvae have hatched. The maggots secrete an enzyme that breaks down the rotting flesh and turns it into soup, which they can then suck up. Take them off, I try to clean the maggots out with my fingers, try to um, clean the, the wounds, because I thought it's a very bad thing what, what happened. It's a four day now of the suffering. Um, you, in your mind now, you, I cannot find a justification for it. Why more? The whole world has forgotten us. By their third day of walking, Carl and Costa have seen no signs of human habitation. They are completely lost. Mentally, this whole thing is starting to take its toll. Shh, shh, shh. I believe I hear a car, but I don't seem to get any closer to where the sound uh, emanates from. I realized that it was my imagination. And I just wonder how I got myself into this mess. It's much worse than he thinks. Not only are they hopelessly lost, but because they have been following the elephant paths, their route has zigzagged. They have walked 60 miles, but in fact, they've only traveled 20 miles from the crash site. And their bodies are spent. For Lynette and Neb, things are going from bad to worse, and Mike no longer has any energy to look after them. I sort of fell into depression that afternoon. I remember even it crossed my mind to go and commit suicide, take my belt to hang myself on the tree because, you know, you, you just wanted to end it. Carl and Costa are reaching the limit of their endurance. My lips are dry, my inside of my mouth is dry, my whole body just cries out for water. At around 12, we, we approach this water hole. I sort of go across the lip. There's no water, there's just no water. And I think that's when you can just sit down and cry. I was really getting down now, and you can't stop there. Because you cannot stop until you find water or till it gets dark. Convinced that rescue is never going to come, Mike decides to make preparations for death. I turned down to Lynette and I said, look, things can go really bad. There is nobody coming for us. I think we need to do one or two things which will protect our families and things like that. I think 
to write our wills. So we took one of my credit card slips and uh, what you call it, um, eyebrow liner, and then we wrote the, 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 the last will and testimony. We actually initialed our signatures, just some indication that if somebody does find us, we were alive for a good number of days before the animals took us away. All five crash victims are now close to death. Carl and Costa are on their fourth day trekking through the African bush in search of the town of Maun. They are now totally lost and disoriented. We see no signs of human habitation, so I, I feel that we might be way, way away from Maun, and I'm starting to doubt whether I took the right decision to walk. The path reaches the choice either to go left or, or right. Left or right. At this stage, I don't really think it really matters if we go left or right. What difference does it make? Left or right. Left or right. Left or right. Right. Costa's decision could mean the difference between life and death for the survivors at the crash site. Lynette's body is beginning to shut down. I woke up in the morning and I started getting, feeling very, very cold. And I was lying in the sun thinking now, Lynette, you have to come to do terms with reality. I could see that she's losing strength in her and the body uh, getting like an old tree. You could feel that he's coming to the end. Neb was also worsening. The pain is now unbearable. We were thinking definitely that we are coming to our end. After five days in the African bush, Carl has lost all hope and no longer trusts his own judgment. As I walk along, I saw a straight line protruding from the trees. I immediately banished it from my brain. As I know, there are no perfectly straight lines in nature and I'm I just don't feel like uh, being disappointed again. I'm sure that I'm imagining. It is a difficult um, looking at the partner that dying. You just got married and you then you lose your wife like that in such a uh, bad accident or, or kind of um, stupid accident, call it. You know, I said, I love you very much, and, and I honor you, and whatever happens in your life, you know, my blessings, and I know that, you know, you will find love again. Continued to walk, not daring to look at this line. But the line is no hallucination. It's the roof of a hunting lodge, the only building for over 30 miles. My name is Carl Duplessis. We were in a plane accident. There's three people out there. 
Injured. Can you please radio for help? While I was drinking the, the juice, I'm really worried about the people back at... at the plane, and I, I still don't know if I did the right thing to, to walk, if I shouldn't rather have stayed there. But it's too dark to send out a rescue team tonight. It's up for grabs whether the injured crash victims can make it through one more night. I was start seeing the vultures uh, coming around our crash site. I felt that you know that they coming for a, for a meal. You know, after five days here, you know, even mosquito for me is like a helicopter. You're just hallucinating. We need to make smoke. Put everything on the fire. Even though the Botswana Defense Force launched its largest ever rescue mission, the plane had crashed so far off course, they would never have found the survivors in time. One of the soldiers comes to me and look at me like this, you know, I said, hey man, you're so strong. If Carl had not made the decision to walk, then all of them would have died in the African bush. When I saw Nep and Mike and Lynette was alive, it was just, it was just that immense relief that washes over you. Lynette's burns were so severe that she spent nearly a year in the hospital and underwent 14 skin grafts. It was touch and go if she would survive. But she and Mike now have two children. Neb made a full recovery and still lives and works in Botswana. And Carl is happily watching his children grow up. The pilot Costa Marcandonatus died four years later in an unrelated flying accident. <laughs>